Anyways, it said that optimal E is used in domain bases. Neither Postgres nor my CD seem to support that. Um, he survives? No. Yeah, they don't have optimal B. They just use like equal width or equal depth. Uh, I think Oracle or SQL Server. Yeah, maybe they do. Yeah, I like equal width and equal depth, I can tell you they're useless. Yeah. I mean, they support it, but for performance, yeah. I mean, if, if, if you are willing to use equal width or equal depth, you are better off just using something. It's going to be much better. Future work that's optimal. Did you figure out how to uh, build the optimal, the optimal, um, optimal? I think so. Huh? I think so, yeah. I was on the how I should go for the first time. I think it was Let me continue with the discussion on transaction. So, 
we demonstrated you know, how transaction works in MySQL. Uh, we demonstrated the, the problem of transaction. Uh, so far, we concentrate on one aspect of uh, what transaction can provide to you, which is to ensure concurrent access to your database. Right? So using this concept of transaction, you can get rid of all these potential conflicts. Uh, as I demonstrated using a couple of examples, right? You may have conflict at uh, attribute level, at tuple level, and even at table level. Okay. But there's one more uh, uh, property that transaction offers to you, in addition to ensure concurrent access to database. This is called resilience to system failures. So an example of this is given in this slide. Suppose you are doing a bar loading of your database, or suppose you are doing this this workflow. Uh, look at this workflow right here. And you're inserting to archive uh, all those with uh, uh, denied decision of their admission uh, of their application, right? Uh, you're moving all these records to the archive and you're deleting from a uh, table, right? In the middle of doing, you can think about this as kind of like bar flowing, right? You're doing a bar flowing taking a lot of records from the apply table and move that into archive table. Imagine in the, in the middle of doing this, uh, your system crash for whatever reason. Right? Maybe you have a hard drive fails, or you lose power to your system. So the database system shuts down, you know, unexpected. Right? Uh, the question is, what happened to this workflow? Well, you don't know, right? If you don't use a transaction, you don't really know how many records have actually been moved over? How many are still left in the apply uh, table? Right? There, there, there are no guarantee what's the state of this particular job. So this brings out this, this concept of resilience to system failures. So bar load is one example. What happens if you had system crash in the middle of doing you know, this bar loading job? So again, using the example I mentioned, so, so you are you're actively moving data from one place to another and system crash. Okay? The challenge here, if you think about it, is that in a database, this is actually not what's going on. And suppose this is data on disk. Conceptually, this is what's going on, but in reality, what happened is you have to cache data to memory, carry out your operation over there, mark those page 30 and write them back. You don't just do everything on this direction, right? So in reality, what happens is you have data caching memory and you are busy writing data back to disk. So this brings an even more significant challenge, which is if you have system failures at some point, what will happen? What will happen is whatever you cache in memory is lost forever. Meaning that for those records you think that you have completed writing them, they may not actually have been made back to disk. When you you know, when the database management system returns to the higher level application saying that, oh, I have finished updating those records, that only means the underlying database management system has marked those pages dirty in the buffer manager. I have finished writing those changes in the buffer manager. It doesn't mean I, you know, the database management system have written those changes back to disk. In other words, those changes may not may have not been made permanently on this yet. Even though higher level application may think that I'm finished doing whatever I need to do, but if you have a system failure afterwards, then you you will see some unexpected behavior from your database management system because of this. Does that make sense? I want to follow this argument. Okay. So you cannot have higher level applications, or in other words, it's really hard for developers to write higher level applications when you have behavior like this. Meaning that 
when the database system tells the higher level application that I have finished taking care of all the changes you want to do, yet later on when the application comes back, some changes, even though I thought have finished, now is not reflected by the database. You cannot ask developer to write code like that. To cope with such behavior by the database management system, right? So in light of that, database management system offer this all or nothing uh, semantic. What, what is all or nothing? This is actually similar to the semaphore concept I mentioned earlier. All or nothing means that either you know, from the eyes of the application, I will, if I declare what I want to do and enclose those actions in a transaction, then either all the actions in the transaction have happened. Once I've finished executing my transaction, then everything must have happened. Or none of it has happened. You cannot have a middle state, meaning that suppose I have 10 statements in my transaction and you come back and tell me, oh, I have finished executing six of your statements. The other four, ignore it. I, I'm just not going to do it. You cannot have that kind of behavior coming out of your database management system. So if users, application developer, declare, okay, the following 10 statements are going to enclose them in a transaction, then a, the underlying, so that the expectation from uh, the underlying database management system is all or nothing. Meaning either all, well, all of these 10 statements get executed, or none of it gets executed. Okay, so this is the semantics of all or nothing, right? Now, how do we guarantee this? That's a separate issue. Does that make sense? How we actually go about implementing this inside the database kernel to guarantee all or nothing? That's a separate issue, which I will defer that discussion later on. For now, you can just view this as a black box that gives you all or nothing semantics. How this actually is implemented within the database system, we will talk about that later. So transaction basically, that means that now we understand the two major properties uh, pertaining to a transaction in the database, which is first of all concurrent access, guaranteed concurrent access to to database without conflict. The second thing is guaranteed this all or nothing semantics. These are two different concepts, by the way. Okay. Uh, the first one, yes. So I was wondering, databases. I guess you could still care, like have all these nice guarantees, even in the case of like maybe it fails like halfway through yeah. writing some buffer, like so half of the buffer gets written in the other half yeah. it doesn't. Does it even guarantee, I guess, in that case that you don't get? Uh, you are essentially talking about the details of how to guarantee this all or nothing stuff and what other okay. behavior. I will, I will rather defer that discussion later on when I get into it. Okay. okay. All right. So, Essentially, to summarize the two properties <coughs> into a transaction, we can summarize using these two bullets. The concurrency control aspect of transaction basically says that you, the underlying system will execute multiple transactions in parallel, meaning that statements from different transactions may end up interleaving each other. However, from the user application point of view, it seems that each transaction is executed in isolation. I mentioned a naive solution for guarantee for achieving isolation is what? Someone tell me what's a naive solution for achieving isolation? Yes. Just one at a time. Yeah, just one, one transaction at a time and do not run any other statement from any other transaction until the first transaction has completed. So the point is. That's not what the underlying database system is doing. The underlying system does interleave action from different transactions. However, from the higher level applications point of view, it seems that that's what's going on. Each transaction is executed. It's statement entirely before the next transaction gets executed. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's essentially the first guarantee. The second guarantee is what we just talked about, which is if the system fails, 
each transaction's changes are reflected either entirely or not at all. This all nothing is matter. A uh, transaction is basically a sequence of SQL statements and in most database systems there is this mode called auto-commit. Okay? So for example in MySQL and Postgres SQL, they have this property called auto-commit, and by default auto-commit is set to true. If that's the case, you do not have to specify begin transaction and commit statement to declare a transaction. Every statement by itself is a transaction. Every single statement is a transaction by itself. That's why you update statement, you insert statement, the changes are reflected in the database immediately, even if you never type a commit statement explicitly. Because by default, auto commit is true. So the every statement is treated as a transaction by itself. In other words, each transaction is just a single statement. That makes sense? But even in that case, you can override this auto commit behavior. What if, for example, I the next few statements, I have two update statements, one insert statement. I want to ensure this all nothing semantics. And either you execute all of them or none of it gets executed. That's impossible if, if you're using auto commit because each statement gets executed right away, right? So what do you do? You write begin transaction. That will override this behavior of auto commit. If you explicitly type begin transaction or start transaction, then the underlying database system will view, will view the subsequent statements as one transaction and wait for that commit statement from you. Or abort, either commit or, or abort, or roll back. That makes sense? Okay. Okay. So this bring up this discussion bring up the next uh, the famous acid properties of transactions. Acid properties. It stands for Atomicity, C stands for Consistency, I stands for Isolation, and D stands for Durability. Okay? So these are the four properties offered by transactions. I'm going to highlight uh, each one of them one by one. We, focus, we start with the discussion on isolation. We kind of know, roughly know what isolation means, right? Isolation means that each transaction appears to be running without the interference of other transactions. Right? That's a kind of like rough definition, right? But to formalize this, actually, you have different levels of isolations different level of isolations. Okay? The strictest level, the strictest level of the or the strongest level of isolation is essentially what we said. Meaning that each transaction appears to be running entirely isolated from others. Meaning saying that they be running they are running in sequential order, one after another. And that's called serializability. Serializability. A serializable isolation level. So the concept of this is defined as follows, meaning that operations from different transactions may be interleaved, meaning you can interleave them in order to improve your throughput. For example, if, if one operation or one transaction is very expensive, take a long, take a long time, while your CPU is idling. For example, this this operation is not using any of your CPU resources, but busy reading data from disk. So it's, it's a lot of I/O stuff, but no CPU. So your CPU is idle. In the in the naive approach, you will have to wait for this to finish and executing subsequent operation from the same transaction before you can do anything else. But 
in real database system, that's obviously not what happens. What happens is if my CPU is idling, I will take this opportunity to execute operations from other transactions as long as they do not conflict with the current operation. Of course, we have to define what I mean by conflict, which I will define in a minute. But that shows you the idea, right? Meaning that operation from different transactions may get interleaved as long as the overall effect at the end of the day by interleaving action from different transactions at the end of the day when you finish executing all these actions the end effect is equivalent to some serial order of serial ordering of some serial ordering of these transactions <coughs> give you an example suppose this is T1 and this is time. Okay? And T1 start with reading of value A and write and let's say commit. A very simple transaction, okay? And T2 is with value B like that. Okay? This is one possible way of executing this. That makes sense? This is a serial order, meaning you, you execute everything from T1 before you start executing T2. Versus I can have T1, T2, where I do read A. Now suppose A is a very large object. Reading this takes a long time. Take a long time. Meaning that the long amount of I.O. Instead of waiting for that, I decide to go ahead and you know, read B. And write. And then at this point, I will write a equals a plus 10. Suppose, while I'm doing this, suppose this now takes a long, long time for I.O. So instead of waiting for this to finish, I will go ahead and do this. Then later, I will just commit and commit. So I'm interleaving, if you think about it, I'm interleaving action from different transactions. But if you think about the any effect of this, even though I'm interleaving actions from different transactions, but the any effect is what? The end effect is the same as that, as T1, then T2. The end effect is the same to that, the same to that. And in fact, you can also argue the end effect of this is also the same as T, T2, then T1. Right? But in this case, T1 and T2 are totally independent. It doesn't matter which one you execute. Yes. So the read A counts at the same time as read B? No, that's just Maybe read A start first, then I realize this takes a long time, then I read B. And suppose I have parallel IO bus, I can do that in parallel. Okay? Then the test. So the argument here, serializable isolation means that you can interleave action as long as their any effect is same is the same is equivalent to one of I don't really care which particular serial order you are equivalent to as long as you are equivalent to one of that then it's called serializable uh, isolation that, that make sense? I can easily change the example so that this is not possible or at least this way of doing it is not possible now I can change this to also read A. Okay. Now what happens? If you come back and change this to is this now still equivalent to T1? 
की बात आती है जो हमने से यस हमने से नहीं तो दिस ऑर्डर इज स्टिल इक्विवेलेंट टू टी वन एंड टी टू ऑब्वियसली नॉट राइट यू आर गिविंग टेन परसेंट फॉर दैन यू प्लस टेन हियर यू आर प्लस टेन फॉर दैन टेन परसेंट लेयर व्हाट हैव इट हियर दैट टेन दैट दैट टेन Imagine these are your bank account, right? That ten dollar will be receiving that ten percent interest in this case, but that ten dollar will not be receiving that ten percent interest in this case. If I'm the customer, I prefer this, but not this. That make sense? Maybe I have beyond this case because I'm beyond this. I, I don't care anymore. The ten dollar ten percent is just one box. You can keep the one box. Right. But imagine the unit is not ten dollar; it's ten million. Oh yes, I can. Go this one. Go this one. Then I guess. But is it equivalent to T two and T one? Someone tell me. Is this ordering equivalent to T two and T one? Answer will be. I need a help. Yes. Um. Yes, because A is read for exchange for T two. So, like T one will finish up. Actually, no, never mind. Because it doesn't take two into account. Yeah. Think twice. <laughs> it's tricky. Okay, it's not an easy thing. Right. So the problem is, you read this value of A. And you update this value of a. By this point, the value of a you cash in the eye of t1 is updated, so it's not equivalent to either of them. Okay. Still go see the trick. All right. Let's a start with hundred bucks. Let's a start with hundred dollars. Uh, what if I do T two then T one? I swap the order of this. I do this first. What's the at end at end of day? What's the value of A here? I'm in ten. Come on. When I read this is ten. What's the end effect? You got hundred to hundred dollar at end of day. Twenty percent gain in a day. That's I see. That's very good. Now coming back here, what do you get? When you read A here, what's the value of A? Huh? Come on. <coughs> huh? Four hundred. Four hundred. Okay. When you read the value of A here, what's the value? Huh? You wait. One hundred. After this, what's the value of A? However, but when you do this, what's the value of this, of this A? It's not one hundred ten because you already read the value of A, and in your eye, you got. Isolated, right? The UI value is still 100. So after you do this, A is what? And no matter who can be first, at the end of the day, what's the value of A? Huh? I don't know about you guys. If it's me, I go with this. Ten bucks was my lunch. Then we just. This is just two transactions. Imagine Amazon.com. You don't just have two transactions. There are millions of transactions, and each transaction don't just have two actions. So it's not simple to interleave them and still ensure serializable. So I, can, I hope I can miss you that. Do you follow what I'm saying? So that's the concept of, you know, uh, serializable isolation model. Okay. This is using our, our simple example to demonstrate that. So once you impose a particular isolation, of course there are other 
isolation level, there's another isolation level I'm going to introduce next. So a simple case like this already brings a lot of challenges, right? So you see the, the conflict here, which is if you want to ensure, for example, serializable isolation level, what's in conflict with that? It is in conflict of improving the throughput of your system, improving the efficiency of your system. How do we improve the throughput and efficiency of your system? Well, you want to interleaving actions as much as you can. You want to have as many parallelism as possible. However, that's in conflict with ensuring a particular isolation level. That makes sense? So, in light of that, people say, okay, maybe I don't need serializable all the time. So I can relax the serializable requirement to go for a weaker isolation level so that I can have more parallelism, more interleaving of action from different transactions. So it's a trade-off between the two. Imagine in the worst case, I don't care about isolation at all. You can, it's a wild west. Do whatever you can. Be your outspot, right? As long as you can beat. You know, I've been watching this series. I highly recommend Longmire. Have you watched this? Suppose you can beat this guy Longmire, then you can do whatever you can. Right? Uh, then you have no isolation at all, but you then your uh, parallelism is at the highest. So you want to balance or trade off between the two. So that's why I'm going to introduce another isolation. There, there are actually four popular isolation level people use. So level, snapshot, uh, rate committed, and there's another one I'm going to cover. I'm not going to cover all of them. I'm going to cover another one. Uh, before I cover the next one, I want to define this thing called dirty rate. So third is you are rating an item by an uncommitted transaction. So if we come back to this example here, by the way, if we come back to this example here, this is one way to understand the problem here. Right? Another way to understand the problem is, so let's come back to that. Right? So another way to change this to, suppose I, I want to fix this problem. I notice that there is this problem, right? I'm going to fix this. How do I fix this? I say, okay, fine. I'm going to do this. I'm going to ask and then I commit. And this, you say, okay, this must be, this must equal to T2 then T1, right? I, you know, at, at this point, when I read, hey, this got $110, and this gave me $120, everything seems fine. Do you follow me? What's the problem here? Imagine this is the bank, uh, this is the user. What's going on is the bank decided to give 10% interest to this guy, and this guy then deposited $10 after the interest is given by the bank. Uh, what's the problem? If you run a bank like this, you will be sued to death sooner or later. What can happen actually? What can happen is the bank may come back and say, okay, wait a minute, that 10% interest is not to you. I made a mistake. Person B. I made a mistake, so I decided to to go back the ten percent interest I given to you. Now what happens? Well, from the eye of this user, at the time I read this, it had a ten dollar. I got hundred. I don't care with you. I mean, I need $120. That dollar, the magic $10 somehow you need to give to me. You follow the argument here? 
Okay? The challenge is you are reading, you are reading a uncommitted item. You are reading an uncommitted item. Uncommitted item that temporarily updated by another transaction, but that transaction has not committed it offer changes to the item yet. Of course, in the ideal case, you, you're hoping that, okay, this guy commit. Then no big deal. But what, what, what happened if this guy decided to go back? Two things happen, right? One is, you know, you, based on the all nothing semantic I talk about, the value A need to be reset to you. Hundred dollars. Like nothing has happened. But too bad, this guy has committed. With hundred twenty dollar in mind. Not only you you lose you ask this guy to forfeit his ten dollar interest, you ask this guy to forfeit the ten bucks he or she has deposited. Your customer will be furious. You know, that's what happened to me once at at and and I decided to, you know, the next thing I did, I got my PIN and account number, I switched another five uh, carrier right away. So this is, the, four, the go back of one transaction calls you to go back another transaction, and even worse, you, you force the rollback of another committed transaction. If this transaction has not committed yet, I'm, 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 I haven't committed yet, then it's not as bad as if I have committed because from the customer point of view, I'm still making decisions. Yeah, you ask then at the middle you tell me, sorry, that interest is, I promise you, is no longer hold. But, I mean, I still feel bad, but it's not as bad as I already signed the contract. Does that make sense? But not, neither case is bad, right? If you decide to go back, how can you cause other transactions to roll back? In the, in the extreme case, you can think about, I, I can construct a really bad case where one transaction depends on another, which in turn depends on another. I have millions of sub-transactions depend on each other in turn. And imagine this happened on Omnidentor.com. Then one supplier decides to roll back the stock, he or she just deposit into his offer shop. That one single action can trigger back trigger all those millions of transactions to go back. I mean, other than cannot operate in that model, in that, in that model right? Of course, you can also argue, I take the risk. This kind of rollback scenario is really rare. And if you don't rollback, everything's fine. I still have some level of parallel. Right? So, so that's kind of the idea of dirty risk. Basically, you are reading, in the eye of one transaction, you are reading a updated item by another transaction who has not committed yet. And any such weight is called dirty weight. You follow me? You're reading a quote unquote dirty item. And that's called uh, dirty weight. Okay, so there, there, there are some several examples. Now I'm going to introduce another isolation level called repeatable weight. Repeatable weight says First of all, you may not perform dirty rates. If you don't have dirty rates, you avoid what your problem. Can you guys tell me? You avoid this cascading rollback problem. This is called cascading rollback. It's kind of like a domino effect, right? The, roll, the rollback of one transaction causes the rollback of multiple transactions. If you don't have dirty rates, at least you don't suffer from that. So that's what repeatable rate isolation level guarantees for you. So first of all, you cannot perform, nobody can perform dirty rates in repeatable rate isolation. And secondly, an item write multiple times cannot change value. An item write multiple times cannot change value. The second requirement is a little bit tricky. Let me give you a special example to illustrate that. Uh, so this is transaction one, transaction two. They're, they're, they are interleaving with each other. Let me ask you this. First of all, I'm going to ask you, is this schedule of these two transactions, is this in serializable isolation level? Are these 
and this cellular door. You know, before you answer that, who can tell me by a cellular door what are you looking for? How do you tell whether there are cellular doors? What 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 should be the criteria you are trying to uh, conditions you are looking for to check whether there are cellular doors? Um, so I see, like, so you have like this ordering, and you want to see if it's either equivalent to yes. like just doing all of T1 and then T2, or vice versa. Yeah, you want to check if 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 that schedule if it's equal to one of them, you don't have to to be equivalent to both of them, but as long as you are equivalent to one of them then it is a symmetrical scan. Now, that means that Dillian has helped us with this. Now, can someone tell me the equal to this? Yeah, it's equal to So this cannot be 
in cellular resolution hub. So cellular level, if you are in cellular resolution level, what happens? This will be rejected. And you have to, you have to, meaning that the only possible schedule in serializable estimation level is to do this or this. You follow me? Which means, you know, if this takes a long time, then you are lowering the throughput of your system. Or if the insert takes a long time, then if you do T2, then T1, again, you are lowering your, your system. So how do we solve this? Well, we can, as I said, we can weaken the isolation requirement and treat, treat that for better parallelism, like so that this interleaving is allowed. How do we do that? Let's check if this is valid in the repeatable rate isolation lab I just talked about. What is the repeatable rate I just mentioned? Transaction without perform third rate, action by multiple time Okay, let's check those two conditions. First of all, is there any dirty rate in this given schedule? <coughs> is there any dirty rate in this given schedule? Yes or no? Huh? No, right? Everything I've, I've, I've read from database H between 10 and 30, those are committed values way before, right? Nobody has changed that since since the start of my reading that. The second time I ask you this time, I'm reading all those guys, those are committed, plus this Bob person. However, it is committed. So it's not a dirty bit. I'm reading a committed item. So it's not a dirty bit. By the way, once you commit, you cannot come back and say go back. It's like signing a contract. Once you sign, done. You cannot regret whatever you have done. I mean, you can regret, but that's as far as you go. As I go. I mean, you can regret the whole day, but nothing you can do about it. Yeah. Regret is a feeling. You can have whatever feeling you want. But nobody cares. Once you commit, you commit. Okay? You cannot rule back. Now, what about a second condition? An item write multiple times cannot change value. It doesn't satisfy that. It doesn't satisfy that. It has bottoms. Okay. Be a little bit careful in interpreting that statement. An item write multiple times cannot change value. What you are saying is the first time I, I perform that rate statement, the selection statement, Bob is not there. The second time I execute the same statement, Bob is there. Think about the objects. Okay, the objects I, I have had. The first time, what do I write? What do I write? I write every object, let's say I have an object, those page is. Okay? The second time, what do I write? Obviously, I'm going to write all these guys again. Plus what? Oh. Suppose I am person H between 10 and 30. So what you are saying is from a set point of view, this set, this set has changed the value. But that's not what the definition says. The definition says item read multiple times cannot change value. Which item has been read multiple times? Those items have been read twice. Have any of those changed values? No. What, do we, what about Bob? Bob is only read once. So it satisfied that requirement. Yes. Um, would it still satisfy that second thing? Like, suppose instead of inserting Bob, like Bob was already in there and you deleted him, so that um, that's still fine. Because again, you read Bob. So you read him once, so that's okay. Yes. Yeah. Does it change if it's count star? Does it change what? If it's count star. So if there's an aggregation in there, does it? I see what you're saying. Okay. Uh, you're saying instead of doing this, I do. Yeah. Excellent question. 
Let me finish what I want to say, and then I'll come back to your question. So now we know there's no derivative, and add some drive other time to not change values. So is this okay in repeatable bit? Yes. So this simple example illustrates the subtlety involved here, which is, and also the point I want to mention, which is, as you weaken the isolation level, you get more parallelism. This is not allowed in serializable, but it is allowed in repeatable rate. Now you can interleave action from macro transactions. You follow all that discussion? Now back to your question, which is an excellent question. The answer to that is no, it does not violate this requirement because item refers to item or object originally in the database, not something you computed on the fly. The aggregate value is something you computed on the fly. Yes, it changed values, but it's not the item that's found on the database. And in the process of computing the aggregate, you are essentially reading those and objects by bond. And those atoms, in the process of computing the aggregate, aggregates, those who have been read, read down the time do not change value. So it's still satisfied this requirement. Of course, you may argue, if I'm an application developer, that's kind of weird, right? The first time is kind of you ask Delta, how many seats are left for this particular price? It tells you, okay, I have two seats left. One minute later, you say, I just want to be sure before I make my booking. You, you ask Delta again, how many seats are left in this particular price? Delta comes back, oh, there are three seats left. That make sense? That's essentially what's going on. If Delta is to enforce serializable, you should not see this behavior. If, I'm in a tra if you declare, okay, my entire booking is one transaction, and I want to use serializable, then Delta cannot do this to you. The first time check, if there are two sets left on this price, then the second time check, it should be still be two sets. I mean, becoming three sets is actually fine. You don't care. Better. What if somebody make a booking during the process where it becomes only one set left? Then you will be not happy with it, right? That makes sense? It depends on, now you understand, right? All this behavior depends on what isolation, isolation level they're going to use in their backend database. Can you change the order of first three two times and then sort something? Uh, can you speak louder and slowly again? Can you? Um, can you change the order first three two times? Can you change the order two times? Like first three, first three. First you do this, the selection. And, and what's on the bottom? And do the selection again. And then you do that. Uh, then that's just a serial scatter. That's just T1 and T2. Right? Yeah. That's just you want to do. That's, yes, of course like, you can do it's that. It's like you read two times, so you can't change it by that rule. But you're not changing, yeah, you, but nothing has changed in that case. T1 and T2, yes, you read this object twice, they do not change value. So not only is satisfied with read, read it's satisfied with read value. It's actually satisfied with stronger activation level in that case. You have some question on your problem. All right, fantastic. The final discussion I'm going to have on this example is what if I move this commit? Suppose this insertion takes a long time. It Bob is a big object. Let's assume each user has a picture associated with it, and Bob uploads a 2 gigabyte picture of himself. Right? So you say, OK, I don't want to wait for this to commit before I execute it. It's blocking my execution of the selection. So what I do, you can start the insertion I commit here. Follow me? I move that commit here. Is that okay? Is this still in repeatable grid? I said it's not. Why not? Um, yeah. Um, it's a dirty grid. Exactly. Now it becomes dirty grid. Now it becomes dirty grid. Okay. All right. So that's another thing I wanted to see about this. Uh, so that's as clear as there are some uh, summaries some, some we did here. So, okay, this is just from a concept point of view what isolation means. And uh, right after the discussion of the following few slides, I will start talking about 
how in the database engine we actually guarantee or achieve different isolation levels. Now, so now we kind of finished the discussion of this. We understand what isolation means. Of course, we still need to discuss how we achieve different isolation levels inside the database engine. I'll talk about that in a minute. But let me explain the other properties first. Isolation. Isolation is achieved by locking, which I will talk about in a minute. Next, we're going to talk about durability. So the point of durability really is, if you allow me to rewind, durability means that from the eyes of your applications, I make changes to the database. What happened inside the database, that's kind of like a black box to me, I don't care. I mean, you have to deliver your promise, which means if I have made my change and I have committed my change, those changes must be durable, must be permanent. I don't care if you come back and tell me, sorry, those changes you made, let me explain how database works, those changes are made in buffer and even though you have committed, but system crash after you have committed, as a result, my buffer have lost, it's and without your changes are lost. Users do not care about all this BS stuff you explain to them. They don't care. I mean, at the end of the day, I pay this money, how you implement your database, that's your problem. I made my change, I commit, you need to make that change permanent. Whether you want to use a buffer and how you do, that's, that's your business, not my business. Does that make sense? Obviously, you have to do something in order to ensure durability. Durability does not come for free because you have this buffer behavior, you have this memory, non you have this volatile storage media in between of user application and the permanent storage you have. As a result of that, durability does not come for free. Does that make sense? You have to do something to ensure durability. How do we do that? Uh, we do that using logging. Uh, again, I will uh, just give you the concept and we will talk about the detail of this later. So that's durability, and typically this is done by logging. I will talk about this in a minute, the logging. Uh, after we talk about concurrency control using logging, we will talk about durability. The last way we talk about atomicity. Atomicity goes back to this all or nothing semantics I talked about. Atomicity says each transaction is all or nothing. I don't, I don't think I need to explain this further, right? Either all changes are made, or none of it has, none of it has made uh, back to the database. Again, ensuring atomicity actually is not trivial. Why is that? Imagine you have a transaction, this is the whole transaction, and you have made these changes, and these changes are made to the buffer. And, and these changes are, all, you know, are in the process, you are in the process of updating these guys to the buffer. And suppose these changes, when they are made to the buffer, they later are prominent to the disk as well. Those ones. And this right portion is still in the buffer, but this blue section has made all the way to the disk already. You know what I mean? Because somebody else tried to replace those 30 pages and buffer decided to and the result of that buffer manually decided to write them back to disk. So those, those are permanent. But at this point I decided to go back. Rolling back changes by this guy is easy. I simply Ignore them from the buffer. What about this change? Once you, once you have written those 30 pages to this, you no longer have the, their content in the buffer. So you no longer have the values before you apply these changes on this. How would you be able to restore to those original values? Because that's what autonomous they need to guarantee, which is if you go back, nothing should be like happened. You need to uh, undo the changes you have made. That make sense? Either you go back or you have a crash. If you crash, this will be everything here is lost. So those changes are now permanently reflect on this. These are lost. But this has been made to the disk. And this wireless the autonomy requirement, somehow you need to magically be, still be able to undo. How do you do that? Again, okay, you're going to use logging for that. 
Uh, we'll talk about that later. So we understand it. obviously not. Lastly, what, what do I mean by consistency? Consistency says each transaction must be viewed as a unit. At the beginning of the transaction, we're going to assume that the database satisfies all functional constraints defined by the users. Then each transaction, at the end of its execution, must ensure the database still satisfies all functional dependencies. Now, that's what I mean by consistency. So consistency for multiple transactions means that no matter how many transactions you have, no matter how you interleave them, if you start with a state where all functional dependencies are satisfied by your database, then at the end of the day, all functional dependencies must be set, still satisfied. Okay? That's a simple uh, concept. So those are our SC property. Uh, now we move on to talk about how we achieve those guys. Now, you know, if you think about what we said so far is what they are, next we're going to dive into the kernel see how we actually support those. And per that five is to ask you to support isolation. I was trying to ask you to do, I was thinking about asking you to do project 6 as well, which is to ask you to support autonomy and durability. But maybe we don't have time, but we will see. Maybe we'll have time. I don't know. But for now, let's just plan for that project 5, which is concurrency control and isolation. Yeah. Um, so does consistency, it seems like does it mainly matter when you have um, like multiple uh, like you know, like your database is actually a distributed system, and it's like spread out across multiple servers. Distributed. Like, I mean, I, I I see where you're going, but I don't. Yeah. Uh, get, can, we can't take this off. Okay. okay. That's a uh, distributed system. is is a much more complicated matter. In fact, in order to ensure asset in distributed uh, database is is not too bad. I mean, you can have a trivial solution for it, but the efficiency and the throughput of your system will be so bad to a point that's not usable. And uh, Julia and others are working on uh, a project with me of building an asset guarantee database in a distributed environment. Okay. Distributed means that you have a database sitting on hundreds of thousands of nodes. And Google even have this Spanner database. I don't know whether you have heard of it, called Spanner. Not only ensure it doesn't ensure the strongest acid property. What I mean by that? No, it doesn't ensure it cannot give you survival uh, isolation level, but it can give you, for example, read committed or snapshot isolation level. Not only in multiple nodes within a single data center, they can do this over multiple data centers where each data center has thousands of nodes. Comparison control. So I'm going to use this simple example, similar to the example I just gave you. In the eye of the database system, your application can be as complicated as you want. At the end of the day, in the eye of the database system kernel, it boils down to simple read and write. Right? For example, to decide I'm going to give 6% interest to A, that could be a really complicated process. You run a machine learning model, whatever, you figure out at the end of the day, yes, 6% is the interest I should be giving out to the users. But from the eye of the database, all those computations is irrelevant. At the end of the day, you ask me to write object A with 6% interest. Does that make sense? So I can abstract away all those complications and simplify my view to read and write to a sequence of read and write to represent any transaction you have. So here I have two transactions. One transaction is initiated by user. Imagine you, how many bank accounts do you typically have? It's a, it's a private question, right? But I, I would imagine you have more than one bank account. Do you? I, I have more than one bank account, okay? So I will transfer money from one to another. That's what I'm doing. I, I deduct $100 from B and add $100 from A. Of course, nowadays most banks do not allow me to do this. They will definitely ask me to deduct $100 first, then add $100 later. But in the eye of the transaction, if they understand what transaction I don't think this bank should worry about because it's all nothing. 
even if I add hundred dollar first, then deduct hundred dollar. Why you care? It's all nothing. Now the last bank will still say fine. Still deduct hundred dollar first, then add hundred dollar. But let's say I insist to do the form, the reverse. I add hundred dollar first, then I deduct hundred dollar from my second account, and I do this using a transaction. So it doesn't really matter how I do it because it's all, all nothing. But suppose that's what I do. At the same time. Let's say the Federal Reserve becomes so nice and decide to give 6% interest to everybody. All the bank accounts in the United States. Okay? Can you guess? And these two transactions interleave with each other. Now, what's the problem? What's the problem? Okay. If the bank asks me, say, Peter, you're a database expert, why don't you run our database? Okay. I will happily accept the job. I will do the following. What I will do is put this in time. And bank says, you are a database expert, I hire you to improve the efficiency and scalability of and throughput of our system, meaning that I want you to introduce as much parallelism as possible. I want to ask after another one after another. So what I will do is they hire me, if let's say Wells Fargo or Bank of America hire me to do this job, what I will do is I will say, okay, I will do this if bank give me a lot of, give me a big check at my salary. Do you see the difference of the two? I hope you do. Because it's you money in control, right? This is you man. And uh, the problem with this approach is that the happy dollar receives interest twice. The problem with this approach is that the happy dollar never receives any interest at all. Neither is wrong. Neither is wrong. So the naive solution is to do T1 then T2. Can you interleave that though? Yeah, of course you can. Now I can change this very easily to make it open. Now I can do Now this is OK. Right? Now this suddenly becomes OK. And I have interleaving, I have parallel and this is this will happen if bank paid me a good salary and I have my integrity in place, which most time I do. Right? Then I will do this. Okay. Uh, so this is a discussion. So the the, the, the challenge is you. The, I think this simple example illustrates you that you cannot rely on any one person 
to design a particular schedule for your database system. That's dangerous. Nobody will use that database ever. In other words, we need to implement this functionality support within the database kernel so that nobody else uh, can dictate how the database system behaves. How do we do that? Uh, we introduce the concept of serial schedule. Serial schedule is just executing transaction in sequential order. T1, then T2, then T3, or T2, then T1, T3. You may have n to uh, n factorial number of uh, serial orders. It doesn't really matter which one you, you choose. Okay? Any one of them is a serial order. Uh, next, we introduce the concept of equivalent schedule. Equivalent schedule says that any effect of two schedules are the same, then these two are equivalent schedules. If the any effect of the two schedules are, are the same, then these are called equivalent schedules. So a serializable schedule is that in a schedule that's equivalent to some serial execution of your input transactions. Okay? This is what we call serializable schedules. So serializable schedules refer to those schedules that any effect are equivalent to one of the uh, serial schedules. One of these factorial possible combinations. And before we talk about how we achieve, so the objective is if, if you are in the serializable isolation level, now we can understand what can formalize that serializable isolation level, right? If you are in the serializable isolation level, what do you want to do? You want to find only serializable schedules. If you are Generating only serializable schedules, you guarantee to be in serializable isolation levels. Let me guess. Okay, so that's our objective. But before we talk about that, uh, first let's introduce a couple of anomalies when you start interleaving actions together. There is a WR conflict, right? Right. And by the way, all these conflicts refer to action coming from different transactions. If those actions are in the same transaction, that's fine. For example, dirty read as an example, you read an uncommitted item. But you're reading an uncommitted item from another transaction. If it's from the same transaction, of course it's fine. I update something I haven't committed yet, I read the value. If you prevent that from happening, nothing you can do. Right? Nothing you can do. So by default, this all this refer to actions from different transactions. So the first one is WR conflict. WR, if you think about it, is exactly dirty rates. R is from transaction two, W is from transaction one. So you're reading an item written by a different transaction. Of course, this WR, W stands for write, R stands for read, refer to the same object. If you write B and read A, that's totally fine. So it's WR for the same object. This essentially is a dirty rate. You follow me? What about RW? What's wrong with read and then write? Same like this should be okay, right? You, you read something and write it. What's wrong with it? For serializable, this may not be a problem, but for repeatable read, this may introduce a problem. I read the object A, then transaction to come and write object A, and I decide to read object A again. So RW will lead to what? Unrepeatable read. So it may not be a problem for your serializable schedule, but it will be a problem for repeatable rate. And in fact, there's no delivery rate here. There's no WR conflict because I have committed. That's a summary here. You had a question? Yeah, so I thought though that um, I thought serializable was a superset of repeat or repeatable read for a uh, dead eyes. I so I thought that like, because you said that it could still be serializable, and I thought it would be serializable because it's not repeatable read. And what's the point? I don't follow you. Because I, I, I thought you said that this could still be serializable even if you had an unrepeatable read. But I thought that, it, I don't know, that was confusing. Okay, I see what you're saying. Okay, let me come back to that point later on. Serializable, okay. Serializable is a, a, a large set of transactions. In reality, what happens in the database engine is that to find all possible serializable schedules is expensive. So it's 
So I will use a particular algorithm that guaranteed to return only serializable schedules. But that's not to say I will return all serializable schedules for you to choose. These are two different things. Does that make sense? So this is what we call unrepeatable read. Lastly, we have WW conflict. Overriding uncommitted data. What's the problem with that? If you look at this particular example, can someone tell me what's wrong with this? This, there is a WW conflict, right? Something write A, something write A, something write B, something, something else write A, write, write B. If you have WW conflicts, the problem is you may end up with a situation like this where one transaction determines the final value of one object and the other transaction determines the final object of the other object, which is not okay because either you ask transaction one to determine the final value of both A and B or you ask transaction two to determine the final value of both A and B. So meaning either you do T1 then T2 or T2 then T1, you don't want to end up with one guy says this and the other guy says that. Does that make sense? So that's the problem with double conflict. So remember, we have these three conflicts and we want to avoid them in order to build survival schedules. So the solution for all this, to avoid all these anomalies, by the way, so to answer Gideon's question, is that these are sufficient conditions but not necessary for serialable scatters. That answer your question. Basically, if I don't have any of these anomalies, I guarantee to have serialable scatters. But it doesn't mean if I have a serialable scatter, you cannot have any of these anomalies. For example, I may still have unrepeatable rate, but I mean that could still be maybe a, a, a serialable unrepeatable rate. So these are sufficient but not necessary conditions for you to satisfy a particular isolation level. So that's the one I want to point out. Nevertheless, if they are sufficient conditions, what that means is as long as I do not have these anomalies, I guarantee to have serialable schedules because these are sufficient conditions. To ensure I have none of these anomalies, people use this uh, particular algorithm called straight to his locking algorithm. Straight to his locking introduces two locks, two types of locks. Share lock and exclusive lock on any object. Share lock means that you can share the lock on this object with not any other number of share locks on this object, but not compatible with exclusive locks. Exclusive lock means that you cannot share the lock on this object with any other uh, locks on this object. Uh, I think I'm running out of time, so let me finish this. Okay. The requirement in straight to this logic is very simple. Each transaction must obtain a share lock on an object before reading and an exclusive lock before writing. That's it. What if you are in conflict with somebody else? Suppose I'm trying to acquire a share lock on object A, but transaction two has already is holding an exclusive lock on object A. Then what happens? Well, the request to obtain a share lock on object A by transaction one has to be postponed. So you have to wait. You wait until transaction two release that exclusive lock on object A before you can proceed. So in other words, something like this. Transaction one, transaction two, suppose I compare a share lock on A, an exclusive lock on A. Something else try to wait. So I try to wait A, right? I, I try to get a share lock before reading it, then this will be blocked until, for example, I finish writing A, I submit. At this point, I will release all locks, then I can proceed with, with A. That's what happens. Does that make sense? So this brings up the next requirement for uh, straight to this locking, which is all locks held by a transaction will be released and are only released when transaction completes, meaning when transaction commits. Either you commit or you go back, actually. Both means that your transaction has completed. So this is straight to this lock. The non straight to this locking release lock anytime, but you cannot acquire locks after 
releasing any log. Meaning that I don't have to wait to release log uh, when I commit. For example, in this case, I give you another example. Suppose I also occur as boot log of B, and I write B. So in the straight to his locking, this guy will be blocked all the way until I'm ready to commit. This is where I will release all logs. So this guy will be blocked all the way here, that we get, in straight to face lock. In non straight to face locking, what that says? What if this takes a long time? Writing a B, B is a few job that takes a long time. For us, you can immediately tell we are blocking this unnecessarily because writing B has no conflict with A. So now straight to face locking says, as long as you are acquiring no new locks, you know this will be the last lock you're going to acquire for this transaction. You can start releasing them. Of course, you cannot release the tooth lock on B yet because you are still writing B, but you can release you can release this lock because you no longer need it. Even though you are not committed yet, you can start releasing locks. So that while you are writing B, I can proceed with writing A. So you have you got better what parallelism out of it. But the, the key requirement is once you start releasing logs, you cannot acquire any new logs. So what's the trade-off of the two? Both of them, I'm, I'm gonna I'm not gonna prove this, but I'm gonna just give you the claim. Both of them guarantees only serialable scatters. They they deliver only serialable scatters. Then you may wonder why not always go with non straight to fit locking? Why bother with straight to fit locking? Seems like non straight to fit locking always be better. The catch is, so non straight to fit locking you may end up with cascading award. What if I do not commit? For some reason, the right of B fails, and I have to award. If you use non straight to fit locking, what happens? Uh, if that's the case, you are reading a You are reading an uncommitted action. You actually allow dirty reads to happen. Because you release lock early before it actually commit. So if this guy abort, then this will be forced to abort. And imagine I can introduce many other transactions, each in turn depend on another. This is the cascading abort. So I then a summary. Both Straight to face locking and non straight to face locking allows only serialable scatters. Non straight to face locking gives you better parallelism, better performance, but you are running the risk of having cascading over. Alright, happy Thanksgiving. I'll see you next week.